you talk about broad cultural trends, um, the, the fact is that a country is defined by its people and their culture. I mean, it sounds so obvious when you put it that way, right? But in the immigration context, it's so often it gets kind of lost and, and it gets lost in sort of like, you know, these this Ellis Island mythology that people love to fall back on. The, the idea that, well, sure, people are different when they come, but they assimilate. You know, they, they just, they turn into Americans. They, they become clones almost of, of the people who are here. But it's just obviously not the case. And if we could get people to talk about this more, I, I think that, uh, we would have a much more rational discussion of immigration in general. You know, there's this thing I call uh, the Irish retort. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. The Irish and the Italians assimilated. Why? Why? Why can't? Yes, you know, exactly. New ethnicity. Right. Yeah. And and it's the cyclical nativism that people allege. Right. It's that you know people used to say this about the Irish. Right. People used to say about this about the Italians. They turned out fine. And so today's immigrants, they'll also be fine. There's a couple of different ways to respond to that, right? I mean, one is to say, well, the times are different now. We're less focused on assimilation. We're less pro-American, which is fine. But the other point is that the Irish and the Italians did change America. I'm not saying it necessarily for the bad. For the bad. It might be maybe in some ways for the good as well. Uh, but every group changes America in some way. Uh, they don't just become clones of um, the people who are here. Uh, there's lots of evidence about that. Uh, and... One of my favorite books on this topic uh, was by the economist Garrett Jones called The Culture Transplant. came out uh, just last fall. It's a topic that has long fascinated me. And, you know, he wrote uh, about the economic uh, studies of this in a way that was much better than I could. And uh, what he shows basically is that if you want to predict how prosperous a country is today uh, and you want to look from the past, right, to make that prediction, you don't focus on the place, right? If you, if you looked at North America in the year 1500, you wouldn't say, wow, this place is ripe for being the richest country in the world, uh, you know, in the year 2000 or whatever. You look at the people, right? You look at the history of the people. So you look at the people who are here now and what is their history? Where did they come from? What kinds of accomplishments do they have? And what was their level of technological sophistication, their level of um, uh, sort of creating efficient states that didn't just you know, sort of steal the property from people, uh, their uh, history of agriculture. If you look at that, then you can make these sort of amazing predictions about which countries are going to be rich and which are going to be poor today. So again, it's the people that matter. And there's so much additional evidence of that outside of the economics literature that I personally find fascinating. Uh, this is a good timing because uh, just today I have a new academic article uh, in economics letters is in, in press that went up today. And the, the finding itself is kind of simple, but I, I think points to sort of a fascinating uh, broader trend. Uh, we know that savings is an important component of an economy, right? People need to save money so that it can be invested and, and used for newer technologies and things. So you want people who have a sense of frugality. You don't want people just spending all their money immediately on frivolous things, right? So how persistent is savings behavior? And so I looked at uh, American data. I looked at second generation immigrants. This is the children of, of foreign born people, right? And I looked at their, their retirement savings as adults, because a lot of them are adults now, right? How much do they contribute to their retirement funds? I then correlated that with the national level savings rate of their ancestral country. So if you take uh, a Chinese, the son of a Chinese uh, uh, immigrant parents in the U.S., uh, how much is he contributing to his retirement fund? How does that compare to the, the national savings rate in China? What you find is a pretty strong correlation that that the the higher national savings rate, the more the children of immigrants in the U.S. will save their money. And this is income agnostic. This is at every stage of the yes income. and so you can do a simple bivariate correlation mm -hmm. right which is nice to make a nice little scatter plot that people enjoy you put the best fit line in but then what you can do is a regression analysis where you you uh, control for everything you possibly can obviously one of them is income right so yes control for income control for education control for uh for sex and for employment levels and such you still see this this phenomenon going on now why is that happening the answer it, it's it's cultural persistence and you see it in so many other ways. I was motivated to do that paper because of so many 
uh, papers on social trust. Just this basic question, how much do you trust your neighbors, right? How much can you trust people in general? Uh, it was back in the 90s when a paper on this was written that found that same kind of correlation that I described, that you can take the trust level of Americans today and then look at the trust level of, of countries of the world today, and then they line up remarkably well. And that paper was on European Americans only. Okay, so this is not, some people, some people think, oh, this is a racial thing. No, it's much more fine grained than that. And so in the United States, uh, Swedish Americans tend to have a greater civic culture that tend to have more social trust than, say, Italian Americans. Just like in Europe, Swedes have a greater civic culture and uh, more social trust than Italians in Europe. All that stuff is still around to this day. And once you see that, you realize, you know, immigration doesn't cause assimilation. Immigration causes uh, a culture transplant, just as, as Garrett Jones described. It's really remarkable. I think that's fascinating because, you know, I think in a lot of discussions about immigration and culture, mass migration uh, proponents will often um, lean on, um, you know, the idea that, you know, oh, you, you know, you, you don't have rigorous data showing these these social consequences and economics is like language. It can be used to lie. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, the, the, the economic stuff doesn't land. But like, what are some other sort of systematically rigorous ways that one can analyze something that can seem nebulous like culture mm -hmm. with regards to immigration? Well, uh, let me give you an example of another paper, uh, very recent. This actually postdates uh, Garrett Jones's book. And it was kind of got some uh, some Twitter play. It was about how uh, white Southerners migrated out of the South after the Civil War and in the early part of the 20th century. Most people know about the great migration of, of blacks, right, to the uh, northeastern and midwestern cities. But at, numerically speaking, there are actually more white Southerners who moved out than, than blacks, not as a percentage, but um, as a total. And they did not go to the cities. They typically went to places like New Mexico, uh, Southern California, uh, Southern parts of Illinois, Indiana, and such. What these uh, researchers found when they analyzed this is that if you look at the percentage of migrant Southerners in a county in 1940, people would move from the old Confederacy to outside of it. Look at that percentage in 1940. It will predict things today, like how much that, that county supports Donald Trump or how much they oppose abortion, or they build evangelical churches. And my favorite, favoring barbecue chicken over pizza. That was one of, <laughs> one of the things they found. And it's funny to see the reaction on the left to this paper, because you know to them, white Southerners are like the root of all evil, mm -hmm. right? And, and you can see them almost like, you know, really sort of clenching their fists and saying, I can't believe these people spread their ideology all around the country. You know, how unfortunate and, you know, maybe it would have been better if they'd split off and, you know, they'd won the Civil War. You, all, people say crazy stuff on Twitter, right? Um, but then the obvious follow-up to that is, why is it that you can believe that about white Southerners, but you can't believe that immigrants from abroad don't bring their culture here as well? And spread it here. Why is it you're going to assume that people from, you know, South Asia or Africa or uh, or Eastern Europe or whatever are going to come to the United States and just assimilate immediately? They're not going to do what white Southerners did. Of course they will. Of course they will. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, is there a scientifically rigorous way to measure um, assimilation? Uh, in the form of, of sort of patriotism in immigrant populations? What, what, what is it that the social science tells you on, on that? Um, because again, one of these sort of um, wells that, that pro-immigration people on the right tend to lean on is, you know, the, the supposed extreme and, and often implied even greater than natives patriotism of immigrant populations. How do social scientists think through that element? Well, this is the, the concept of patriotic assimilation, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's the idea that one need not necessarily be fully culturally assimilated in the sense that they're indistinguishable from Americans, but do they at least see themselves as Americans? Do they, do they in the same way that, that others do, the natives do, or the people with, with a lot of um, time spent in the U.S. do? And admittedly, I mean, that data is, is not easy to, to come by, um, but my sense of it is that there is a kind of 
uh, hyphenated American uh, phenomenon that does seem to persist, especially among Latin Americans. You know where you know you know what what best defines you. You know uh, American, Hispanic American, Latino American, so on. Uh, there there is a large percentage. I don't have the data. They will say, well, it's you know it's Hispanic American. Um, and now, how important is that? It's hard to say. It's hard sometimes to to connect answers to survey questions with actual behavior. But uh, I do think it is certainly a cause for concern.